geothermal aspects of hot stratigraphic reservoirs, so I didn't want to duplicate that. Um, <clears throat> and recognizing one of the keys about uh, key things about a Penrose is we have an incredible diversity of expertise in the audience. That's a strength. So we've got some people who will know a lot about some subjects, and there are others who will know nothing, and some people are a bit about everything. So I think the idea that we wanted was to try to at least bring everyone concept conceptually up to a level of understanding of, of geothermal issues and challenges. Yep, we're just getting in the way of the screen there. Can we just shift that back a little? Yeah. Um, so I've picked up a number of points here that uh, I'll touch on. I'll be bouncing around. Some will be relevant to basins. Some will be relevant to high temperature resources. Tried to use examples that we're going to see on the field trip on Wednesday. A lot of you are going to be on that. So I thought it'd be kind of useful just to show some material from that. Also, once I saw Joe and Stu's slides on yesterday, I chopped out about a third of mine and thought, right, let's just focus in on what might be useful. So in the handout, you'll find there'll be extra slides shown there that I've chopped out. So let's progress. Um, let's try that. There we go. And the first thing I wanted to talk about was heat flow, which is a pretty simple concept for those who are familiar with it. But what's important, we saw in Joe's talks, when, you, when you're dealing with high temperature systems and convective flow, conductive heat flow is of limited value in terms of extrapolating temperatures with depth because it's no longer conductive. You can use heat flow measurements to map outflow zones, but the whole reason we have a lot of geochemistry, like Stuart's just been talking about, is because that's the best tool when you've got moving fluids to work out what you've got at depth. But when we come to basins, you need to at least understand thermal conductivity actually can be very important in determining whether you've, say, got 150 C down at your target depth, let's say three kilometers, or you've got 200 C. Uh, and so just to get everyone up to speed on that issue, um, I've got a few slides at the start on heat flow measurements and in particular the importance of conductivity. Wonderful map from the SMU group, Dave Blackwell and co, who will be at the meeting later today, they should arrive. Uh, the red colors, high heat flow, um, and then your cooler colors, lower heat flow. It depends. We're getting a bit of feedback, aren't we? I wonder if it's that one. Well. I'll stand further over here. Um, the resolution of this, of course, is inappropriate for the prospect scale for geothermal developments and, and uh, particularly in the Great Basin. It's, it's good for indicating where we may have the temperatures we want at the right depth, but it's uh, poor when it comes to the resolution of tens of kilometers, which of course is, is much more detailed than what this shows. Um, in terms of uh, heat flow measurements, we can do a lot of shallow temperature measurements in the big basins where convection is not an issue in order to give us an estimate of what the deep temperature is. And I just want to run a few slides. Using the Black Rock Desert, that will be our first stop on Wednesday, as an example of how we do that. And there's also a slide here from Mark and Christian, a few of the people here that talk about that as well. Uh, big broad basin, we, ha we know we have as much as three kilometers of sediments from the gravity. Young volcanics, as you can see here, at the north end of the basin, there is a thermal spring with 87 Celsius. And when you look at the amount of water coming out there, it's mean as much as 20 megawatts thermal. But apart from that, the rest of the basin, no signs. It's just conductive, a lot of mud that's filling in the basin. So drilling holes to establish heat flow is a very good way of working out where the hottest parts of the basin are. No equations, certainly not symbols, but uh, expressed descriptively at the top of that slide, 
heat flow is thermal, is, relates to thermal conductivity, property of the rock, times the temperature gradient. So the more thermally conductive the rock is for a given heat flow, the lower the gradient, and vice versa. We can measure the conductivity if we can get hold of the rock by actually imposing a thermal regime on it, looking at the, at the, the temperature for the given heat flow disturbance. I'm not going to go into the methods of measuring conductivity, but we're able to measure that fairly easily in the lab. And of course, if you've got holes, you can measure the temperature gradient as you see. Oops, wrong slide, wrong uh, thing. Um, in the right hand lower diagram here, nice gradients, which can act in this particular case because there's a lot of mud, rich rocks, low permeability, can be extrapolated to depth. The key thing here. Conductivity of rocks can vary by at least a magnitude of two, particularly with a mixture of minerals, but unconsolidated rock with porosity because the thermal conductivity of water is 0.6 is low. When you have basin filling rocks, then the conduct oh, I'm a slow learner. Um, the conductivity of rocks can be almost as much as a half bedrock lithologies. So carbonates and sandstones with a low porosity can easily have twice the thermal conductivity as basin filling rocks. The result for that is that uh, unconsolidated rocks act as a thermal blanket which can bump up your temperature in the underlying bedrock and can be the difference between the temperature that you want being prospective or being too cool for a given thermal regime. And hypothetically, just ramming that home, uh, for a fixed heat flow, in this case 100 milliwatts, you've got a, a lot of lithologies there with, uh, in this case, near surface, low thermal conductivities. Shale, incidentally, will also have pretty low thermal conductivity compared to your more competent rocks. Dolomite tends to be a little bit higher. There's sandstone quartz has an even higher thermal conductivity. Granitic rocks tend to be less than three. So your gradient can bounce around the place, and you need to understand that if you're extrapolating to greater depth and basins. Oops. Just one slide here. Uh, once we're looking at data in basins, particularly in the US, thousands of wells drilled in most of our basins, you can get bottom hole temperatures that are recorded soon after they stop drilling and wanted to run a whole lot of logs, they often, they nearly always will run temperature with them. These days, they bundle up all the logs, and so you only get one or at most two temperatures with time as they run a, if they run a sequence of logs. In the old days, they used to run a whole lot of logs, and you could see a progression as the well was warming up. The problem with this data is it must be correct that it nearly always underpredicts the temperature in the basin, and that's because of the drilling effects, the drilling disturbance. There are lots of ways of trying to correct it, but inherently it's a noisy data set. And the reason, I think, if you had to put your finger on one reason is because differing amounts of mud while they're drilling or drilling fluids can go out into the rock immediately before they stop, and they may circulate a bit to clean up the hole, and they run their logs. Because of the every hole slightly different, you find that it's a noisy data set, but you do need to correct it. The in-situ temperatures will be higher, as much as 20 degrees C once you're down several kilometers. And there are a variety of methods to do that. And just finishing this topic up, um, the shallow measurements that I was showed in an earlier slide are all up in here. And in this particular basin, the Black Rock Desert are down in Utah, they extrapolate well to what we see down in the deep wells. And in the hottest part of the basin, very high temperatures. This was an oil exploration well. The bottom hole temperature is shown here, corrected. We've estimated heat flow using the conductivities, estimated from the cuttings, and the gradients that are shallow wells that are in the area up here match the deep ones here. 
These wells over here, yes, there's lower heat flow, but also they hit bedrock at a much earlier level. And if you don't have much of that thermal blanketing on top, you're going to have cooler temperatures down below. So finally, the map here of heat flow, you can use these shallow measurements to work out where the hottest parts of the basins actually are. And you can get more detail on that poster. The one danger has already been alluded to with these sorts of measurements. If you've got outflow subsurface or at the surface from springs, sub an outflow zone, then you've got to be careful. You cannot, in fact, extrapolate to depth. So this is Roosevelt, which will be our second stop on Wednesday, our lunchtime stop. Power plant there, twin power plants there, actually. This is the heat flow map that was derived before the power plant was ever put in place. A thermal plume here with high heat flows heading up here to the northwest. When you look at the chemistry, that same box is sitting over here. This is where the bore field and the power plant is. There's actually, a, you can see a chemical plume that heads out at shallow level. That's an outflow leakage from the field. And just as sort of a caveat, be very careful extrapolating temperatures if you're near to a hydrothermal system, which this is in this case. Okay, now I'm flipping across and thinking of uh, deep wells, which could be in a high temperature geothermal system or in some basin settings. And once you have open zone in the well, and we need, we're looking for high permeability. That'll be a theme that will come through, I think, in, in the rest of the conference here about for geothermal to be effective, we need high permeability. When you have it, though, in an open section of the well, that high permeability zone tends to control everything. Um, and in effect, this repeats why, what I had just said before in terms of temperature and pressure logs. You can get critical information from your open zone from these measurements, but you have to be careful that you don't start over-interpreting in terms of a vertical width in the country rock that they refer to. Logs can be static or flowing, and in a geothermal sense, that's really helpful for interpreting what actually your fluid, fluid properties are. If you're running logs when it's flowing, you can see where the fluid entry is occurring. Similarly, when it's static, you can also get important information. And I mentioned before, the best permeability coming from the, uh, is indicated by a feed zone, and that will control certainly the pressure regime in the whole well. And I've got an example of that. So, this, this is important when you're looking at temperature logs and well, or even understanding pressure regimes in upflow zones of hot springs. In this case, I've shown a well here case down to 400 meters. If you inject cold water into it and fill the well with cold water, which is a common method in, in geothermal completions, then uh, because cold water is more dense, one gram per cc versus very hot water, it's more than 200 C, you're down to about 0.8. So the pressure gradient you have in the well will be different. So if you're injecting cold water and then you run a pressure log, you may find the static level, if it's got good permeability, could be a couple of hundred meters below the well and in this case, I've shown there's a pressure control point here at 500 meters. Your water will be largely going out at that point. It'll be in balance with where there's good permeability. And so you'll be under pressured. If this is roughly the pressure gradient in the country rock, in the well itself, with cold water going in, you'll be under pressured with respect to the country rock above the zone. You'll be over pressured with respect to the country rock below that zone. So the water will tend, it will obviously equilibrate here, a lot will go out, but also because you're overpressured, you'll probably find you lose water out the bottom of the well because of the overpressuring. Similarly, if you don't have adequate casing, it's very easy for, for cooler water, 
assuming you're cooler on top of the reservoir, hotter down below. Uh, easier for cooler water to get into your well if you've got a casing leak or whatever because it's overpressured up here and can potentially flow down the well. And once a cold flow starts and exit here, you can have, in geothermal we call it the dreaded downflow. Once they start, they're real hard to stop because it's stable with respect to the, uh, the pressure profile you've got out in the country road. And I'll have an example of that in a minute. The other point, just to note, the reverse of that with a hot spring system, if your pressure gradient down in your reservoir, if you have upflow, let's say up a fault zone, you may be able to push the water out to the surface. If for some reason that flow stops and the upflow column cools off, then it'll be really hard to start that. The spring will probably stop flowing until some event an earthquake or something bumps pressures and gets the flow to go again and it'll stably flow out as opposed to just having an outflow below the surface. I wanted to show the two examples I've just talked about, Roosevelt and Cove Fort, which will be our third stop, why some of these pressure measurements are important because they help understand the hydrology of a system. Look up at Roosevelt Field here. So we've got pressure across the top, this time in PSI. So everyone in the US, if you're oil people, will be very comfortable with these units. Feet down here. Out in the basins around this area, you can look at these are oil exploration well data. We're from DST, Strulston Tess. You can define there's a regional pressure gradient that's on hydrostatic. In fact, the whole of the Great Basin out here, everywhere I've looked, it's nearly always hydrostatic from near the surface. In the case of Roosevelt, however, these are measurements from different, different wells. We, of course, have a gradient here which is less. It's also hydrostatic, so it would be equivalent to 0.8 grams per cc or 0.36 psi per feet if you're in those units. And... So at shallow depth here, it can feed a spring system up at the surface here at 6,000 feet, overpressured, and also have an outflow that flows out into the basin and merges with the regional hydrology. So working back down at the reservoir, conceivably the water that's down here at, uh, where are we down, at 10,000 feet, it could be coming either from the valley or the adjacent hills if there's high permeability, feeding in, getting heated, and then rising up and giving the extra head at the surface there. In contrast to that, we have Cove Fort, the, the third stop we'll be looking at, where in the vicinity of field there's no chloride water coming to the surface. ENEL that are developing the power plant there right as we speak, hope to commission at the end of the year, have, have released some data and they've said the actual hot water table, in effect the head on the hot water column in the reservoir is close to a thousand feet below the surface. The question is why is that the case? And then over the top is just shallow groundwater flooding across it and the, where the reservoir is hot enough, you've got steam coming to the surface, there's been alteration in the overlying groundwater, gives the acid features, so you sort of get this cap separating groundwater at the surface from the reservoir at depth. Two totally different situations, but knowing the pressure regime is important in terms of understanding what the flow may be. In this lower case, Cove Fort, turns out about 10 to 15 kilometers to the north is a spring that Stefan here has worked on a number of the springs, cold springs, warm springs. There's one warm spring, I think it's 27 Celsius, and got chloride water in it, very dilute. And its elevation is at 5,000 feet. And there's a very good chance that the carbonate reservoir that's sitting here is fractured and equilibrating laterally some 10 plus kilometers to the north. And that's why it's under pressure. The um, this I well, it's you've got to be tricky because we're here. We're looking vertically, and the groundwater here 
sits on top of impermeable rocks and there's been alteration or whatever. So that is unconfined. In effect, this is unconfined as well because we're saying it's linked through fractures laterally off to the side. So there is a steam zone here, and Joe briefly referred to it, a shallow steam zone at Cove Fort, and you could say, well, that is confined because there's got this clay cap over the top separating it from the groundwater. You've got to be very careful in this sense. In fact, everywhere I've looked in the Great Basin, extensional faulting, there's very little that's confined, like a classic basin setting, sediments that end up being overpressured the deeper you go. In the Great Basin, you just don't find that. And I'm going to talk at the end, come back to that actually, the very last slide. The example from Indonesia is the same thing. In this case, a volcano-hosted system, but it's reflecting the same thing. The elevation of, of up at the bore field is up at 1,200 meters above sea level, and it would be this would be the hydrostatic gradient if uh, if you had springs or water from the surface where all these wells are. However, when they drill their wells, they find a nice, when they put all the pressure data together, it's a hot hydrostatic gradient. And if you extrapolate that upwards, that could feed a spring at about seven or 800 meters above sea level. And it turns out there is a chloride spring way down the flank of the volcano at that elevation, and it's, that's where this reservoir is leaking out laterally in an outflow zone, and the liquid reservoir, the chloride water in the reservoir, is in effect being controlled by that outflow zone. So you have steaming conditions above, so above the level of the head within, the, within this Within the field, so we're higher up on the volcano, there's probably steaming ground. There is steam that leaks up and comes to the surface here, whereas you won't see the chloride water until you're way down the flank. Oh, let's get that right. Okay, this is almost a textbook example of, of the idealized case I showed before. And it's an example in how in many geothermal wells, we initially uh, inject cold water to look at a pressure pivot. And so in this case, we've got temperature on the bottom axis here, and it's these wig wiggly, this, this curve here and this curve here, the T's. We have pressure on the top axis. The actual units you probably don't need to worry about. But what we've got here under injection and uh, usually soon after drilling, oops, so I'll leave that one, make sure I get the right button here. I'll come to those, well, this will explain what I'm about to talk about now. Under injection, cold water going in. You can see a little bit of a jump here. At this depth, you notice the pressure profile, the cold pressure actually, we're under pressured with respect to the hot reservoirs. There's a little inflow coming in here. And then a lot of the water is probably going out at this depth and then the rest of the water going down to the bottom of the hole. And you can see after a week, they run the same probes, the pressure, the water's heated up, it's pivoting about this 1400 meter level, it's actually heated up the peak uh, temperature in the well now, which is close to 300 Celsius, sits right there, and over the ensuing weeks it would probably heat up even further and develop a, a boiling point profile It might fill the well with gas. What you can get from that is basically the conditions at this horizon here. Everything else you see in the well may not be typical of what's out in the reservoir. And that comes back to this point. Be careful about over-interpreting the data. In this particular case, Kawara for New Zealand, a, a, a highly productive well in New Zealand. The other thing that's worth conceptually understanding, and this profile is actually from Roosevelt, but looking, it's a condition, this field has actually been drawn down, doesn't matter right here, but a couple of things here. First thing, casing is here, now stands with liquid with some steam over the top. Steam you should normally, if it's static, 
show no pressure gradient at all. What you've probably got here is a little bit, it's on bleed. So there's a bit of flow up the well, there's a pressure gradient in the steam, and you can see the slight drop in pressure. When they open this well up, it's kind of interesting to look what happens when it's on discharge. Highly productive. And I'll show you. Here's, here's, here's what you get. Down here, the, it's a liquid feed. It's now drawn down compared to the static condition, so that's the driving force. Fluid is flowing into this well, and it's coming up the well bore. And usually you can put a line here, and you could say, here's the first depth of flashing. And from here on up, it's two-phase. It's depressuring, so as it's coming up the well bore, you're getting more and more steam in it. The fluid's accelerating as it comes up and on discharge into the power plant. Quick question, because it relates to how Stuart finished up. Why is this depth important? Anyone want to quickly venture why we need to know? A, a developer likes to know where this first depth of boiling is. Incidentally, the oil people call it the bubble point. The first, uh, anyone want to? Deposits is actually it. Uh, uh, there's uh, dissolved CO2 in the well. On first boiling, you start to get CO2 coming out into the steam, which causes carbonate. You can inhibit it. So they need to know where do I, where do they set their inhibitor line, which is a small capillary line where they're bubbling an in, inhibitor, carbonate inhibitor down. They need to set that below that point. And so they need to know where that is. So running a log while you're discharging is actually very important. They probably put an inhibitor in down here so that it stops the carbonate coming out. The other thing I'll just show here, what happened, you never see these profiles because there's a pump in the well, but what's the effect of a pump? Forgetting about the flashing and everything, pumps boost the temperature and push it out the top of the well. Um, that's the effect of a pump is at some level that you've got sitting is to basically pull the fluid in at the bottom and then push it out the top. Pumps don't work when you get cavitation and there's a lot of issues with them, but in effect, that's what the profile would be with a pump. Let's, uh, what about production with time in a field? thinking, getting away from just one well, what about a whole field? And I've got here the analogy with groundwater. You get a cone of depression around a, a well that you're pumping or producing from. In the case of a reservoir that's very permeable, but like a bathtub, you're going to pull down the whole reservoir. And so the a profile, which might have been before development, is here. You get this drawdown of the liquid zone with time as you pull a lot of fluids out. One of the interesting, just as an aside, I was measuring uh, some 20 years ago working in Nevada, at Nevada, Reno, in Moana, there's a very, there's a, a warm water there and wells and a very permeable gravel. I was following around a driller trying to work out well, just how permeable were they and measuring and then he was producing with uh, some water out of a well and I was measuring what happened in terms of the water level time. Normally in a well, you start pulling water out, the water level will drop. Well, what happened in that well, as, I, as he started pulling the water out, the water level rose in the well. Really weird. And then it took me a while to realize it's the well bore is heating up. He's pulling in warm water. It's going to this effect of going from cold column in the well to hot. And it was so permeable that all, there was actually very little pressure drawdown and the effect of going from cold water to warm water caused the water level to rise in the well. Trick for rookies. Let's uh, go on. So Roosevelt Field, I've got a couple of slides relating to that. We've already seen it this morning. Four production wells and 80% of the injection fluid going into this well here, which is really close to this 54.3. That will be important in a minute in this, in this coming slide. Um, and there's some other wells they don't use on, that I'll be showing pressure from. 
but the bulk of the production from one, two, three, four. Bulk of the injection here and a small amount over here. This incidentally was the hottest well in the whole field when they drilled it. They're using it as an injector, and that's one of the challenges. The distance here is a few hundreds of meters, and yet over 25 years, uh, how come it hasn't cooled off this well substantially? And it just highlights, once you get into fracture networks and dealing with hot fluid and cold fluid, some strange things can happen. So they've had 35 bar drawdown here. And I'm going to show you now in the, the monitor wells, so what has happened with time. Natural state here defined by a number of wells, which is, we'll see the profile on the next slide. Early on or after about 10 years of development, the wells had a steam in the top and then, the, and then a, a liquid gradient. There probably was a steam zone formed just in this depth range and largely behind the casing. Of course, the well itself fills with steam and is equilibrating with steam pressure here and somewhere down here, liquid pressure. And then with further development and further pressure decline, you've got uh, the liquid zone here. There's your 35 bars, and you have a bigger steam zone that's formed that can leak to the surface and is leaking to the surface there, but also is in a potentially attractive resource if they want to expand the ball field. 30, 35 bars, 500 psi. That's the natural uh, pressure gradient again, like we've been talking in the various other slides. Here's what's happened with time in the various wells. The one production well of the four 54.3 that's close to the injector has a much higher pressure gradient. So we're seeing the effects of injection on the pressure in that well. Uh, but in terms of, it, we're probably, they haven't done tracer experiments or chemical measurements here. There are probably chemical effects as well, but the thermal breakthrough hasn't happened yet. And that's one of the things with these high flows. The steward mentioned, you typically, the pressure effects are first. You then get a chemical effect that follows later, which is telling you the fluids are getting through, but the rock path in between has heated them up. So that's how you see the chemical effects, but not the thermal effect. Finally, you get a thermal breakthrough, and that's when your production well is in trouble. The cooled water has finally made it, cooled down the adjacent rock uh, on that flow path. Let's. I wanted to briefly touch on, yeah, we're, we're right. Um, getting back to thinking about basins um, and the different type of pressure measure in the oil patch. Love these down, the drill stem tests. Got a device after they stop at a zone of interest or they perforate at a zone of interest, which can go down and you get this sort of uh, a, a trend with time. So we've got hours on the bottom there. So let me just explain. Yeah. Hours on the bottom here, so they were taking the tool down, it's sensitive to the column in the drill stem. So it's in a it's apparent hydrostatic pressure. That's just the load of fluid that's sitting above it in the it's not the real pressure. They have can have a period of time where they try to flow into the well and measure the pressure response. In this case, very low permeability. The pressure here absolutely tanks. They're able to shut in and get a final pressure which you're able again to solve for in terms of uh, Horner plots. I'm going to go into the details there, but you can get a shut-in pressure in the well. They usually repeat it, so you get a couple of shut-ins, and then back to the hydrostatic and as they come out of the well, plus measuring temperature here. Um, different type of information for different purposes and they often like to sample the fluids that are down there to work out if they're getting oil in there or what are they getting. Um, so pressure gradients here, there's an examples here of sort of theoretical. If, um, if you've got just cold water, and this time it's PSI per feet, you find actually pressure units and mass flow units, they drive you nuts. If you're familiar with uh, one set and then depends what literature you're reading, oil industry, PSI per feet, 
geothermals, typically in bars. Sometimes you, you get uh, MPA if you're in the more scientific literature. So anyway, this is you end up with a lot of different language. You have to just run with the flow. If there's degrees of overpressure in a basin, which in this case with depth here, pressure here, you can see here measurements plus some rogue ones into a higher overpressured regime here, expressed as gradient from the top. And of course, if we're into hot conditions, we'll be looking at this lower pressure gradient in, a, in what we would call hydrostatic conditions. Um, and then we get into the issue here is, are there overpressured zones for sort of targets now, source rocks that are being drilled with horizontal wells, where overpressure is generated by hydrocarbon formation, um, as this is the sort of trend you get, and this is actually from a field down in southern Utah, Utah's biggest oil field in fact, shows very nicely you have at shallow depth, ground surfaces up here, you have aquifers in the overlying units, sedimentary units that happen to be Permian getting up to, actually even Mesozoic up at the top up here. And then you get into the Pennsylvanian, which is where the resource is, and you get a lot of evidence of overpressures. This is where the main areas develop. You go underneath it into carbonates, Mississippian carbonates. And in the talk, well, we'll save that for a minute, but wherever you get carbonates over a very big area of this basin, hundreds of kilometers, when you look at the pressures in the Mississippian, irrespective of whether you're underneath or was overpressured or the Mississippians missing for, or the Pennsylvanians missing for some reason and the Mississippian comes up shallow, there's one pressure regime underneath the whole basin. So that's showing there's a high permeability in these Mississippian carbonates this controlling pressure in them irrespective of what might be at shallower depth in parts of the basin or in overpressured areas. Contrast that in this particular case with where there's relatively whatever, if there are ceiling units, they're faulted and ruptured, you get hydrostatic from the near surface down to great depth. And that's actually a pattern in the Great Basin, everywhere I've looked, it's hydrostatic for the, for the whole depth. I wanted just to, I think this is the second to last slide, and follow up on that, because we've been looking for hot basins as part of our project that Joe and I are co-PIs on, and realizing outside of the Great Basin, there's a wealth of data in some of the reservoirs, particularly in the Rockies, where, and there's a lot of exploration and development going on in there from an oil perspective, but two particular cases where they've gone deep enough to get fluids of about 200 Celsius, the sort of temperatures we're looking for, and they find great permeability. In both cases here, so Piance, which is on the Utah-Colorado border, in this particular case, a well mobile drilled on the eastern side of the Piance near the town of Rifle, city of Rifle. In the other case in here is the Deep Play, Burlington for a while had it up in the northern Wind Rivers, where they produce sour gas from the Madison, from carbonates down at 20 to 25,000 feet, so we're talking seven kilometers. Various zones of overpressuring at shallow depth related to, in particular, hydrocarbons, but when they break into the Mississippian down there, they're back to hydrostatic with respect to, the, almost with respect to the surface. And they invariably report great permeability, different sort of fluids that are in there. And so why this is important in my mind is we're looking for these 200 C temperatures. We're also looking for very high permeability. It'll come out in this afternoon's talk. And the nagging doubt, once the temperature is up to 200 C, are the rocks going to be more ductile? And will you actually be able to find them? Well, here's two cases where they can find high permeability down at great depth and the temperatures in the zone of interest that we're looking for. Have I 
and this just wraps it up. That figure got truncated. Um, final wrap up, I might just make it a point that there's various references to Sonic. What's really interesting, this is a, a Sonic profile from a vertically discharging well. It's actually steam. It's really interesting to watch when they open up a well and let you watch the velocity increase. When it's subsonic, you'll just get a, con a, a uniform open sort of upward cone of, of fluid coming out the well. And then suddenly, and it's literally like that, suddenly it pops and you get this, what they call a tulip. It's hip sonic and it has that shape. It's really impressive to see. So you know the speed of sound is coming out at that point because of that shape. And so I guess just wrapping up the whole thing, if I had to uh, try to think of a theme for the talks we've had this morning versus what we're going to get from now on for the rest of the conference, it's a bit like, for those of you who are familiar with the petroleum sector, there's an incredible diversity of geoscience information needed that goes into understanding petroleum systems from everything, from the fluids, the chemistry, the rock, the permeability, the flow regime. When you come across into the geothermal side of things, we're in a much higher thermal regime, but it's, it's also... Uh, the same sort of thing. There's a lot of different geoscience techniques and understanding that needs to go on in order to figure out what you've got in your reservoir and the nature of fluid flow. And I think that uh, the merging of these two lots of expertise, the high temperatures from geothermal and all the related science that goes with that, and the expertise from the petroleum patch, that's one of the key benefits of having this diverse group of participants here is looking for what can be gained when we get the right people together and looking at the issues that cross-cut both high temperatures but reservoirs and basins that are analogous to high perm reservoirs in the oil patch. How can we apply the two lots of technologies to uh, understand better production of fluids, particularly this window, 150C to 200C, which is really the uh, very upper end of the petroleum patch, and it's the lower end of the geothermal patch, but that's where the energy potential is, particularly in the US. So I'll end it there. I see it's 25 past 12. That's pretty good timing. Any questions to fill five minutes? Yes. Everything, whatever you can get. We need. I'm going to talk about permeability this afternoon. Oh, but in the, uh, in the, uh, the yeah. so on the yes, yes, fractures, and so I'd say virtually all the high temperature systems, um, it's fracture control permeability and volcanics and that sort of thing. Yes, in fact, so that's going to come out this afternoon. What we're looking for in basins is actually high, by oil industry standards, pretty high permeability and very high flow rate wells. And that's one of our challenges. And that's why we have to sort of cherry pick initially because uh, there's limited examples that demonstrate the power potential from these deeper hot basins, but carbonates potentially can have that permeability. And we're talking, in fact, in terms of transmissivities, three to 10 Darcy meters. I'll get into that this afternoon as well. And it is doable. We find examples of that, but we're obviously cherry picking to find the best just to make it economic because at the end of the day, we're trying to sell power and we're underpinned by the natural gas price. So we're cherry picking the best of the best to find examples to demonstrate power production from these hot basins. From injection wells? Um, yeah, but uh, spacing you'll find in the geothermal setting and the modeling we've done, again, it'll be this afternoon, 500 meter spacing or um, 
Yeah, you'll get all this this afternoon about, you know, what what is the sort of ball field we have to have to make this work? What's the reservoir conditions? That's the sort of the talk, 30-minute talk for this afternoon, is painting the picture, what we need to get. And we'll probably pose a lot of questions after that. Yeah, there's a lot of deviated wells of geothermal, and I've got several slides this afternoon. That's why Kate and I haven't exchanged. We're both on this afternoon. You'll get totally different talks, and it's going to be kind of interesting to see the different perspective. Yeah. So I do have a number of slides, and in fact, virtually my last one shows a traditional oil field. It's actually Annis again. They've, they've got a five spot configuration, 40 acre spacing. They've got some horizontal legs, they've done water flood, and then the Barkin oil field, a slide that Will sent me, low perm reservoir where they've got 40 stage fracks, got them on the same scale, and posed the question, well, what for a geothermal power plant where we're looking for high permeability, what would our optimum bore field look like? Would it have some horizontal legs on producers? And I'll tell you, it depends on what oil field you're looking at. New field out in the Uinta Basin to the east of us, they're under secondary stage water flood. Their typical completion pattern is to drill the producers with a modest horizontal leg and have vertical injectors. Is that a model we might be thinking of when we're thinking geothermally? I'll leave that as a rhetorical question at this stage. Is there another question over here somewhere? Yeah. Short, the short answer is yes, and I did originally have slides in there and then decided that was getting a little bit off target. But yes, they've formed a steam zone, it's leaking to the surface big time. They've now had an expanded steaming ground to the, the northern area there. It's, unfortunately, we won't get time to look at it. They now have superheated fumaroles there. You can see sulfur being precipitated. It's actually a really interesting area. In the very early days, because it's around the old hot spring area, a whole lot of junipers died off, and our good friends from BLM charged them $25 per dead juniper because of the spreading, uh, yeah, Jim's from BLM here, uh, spreading steaming ground. So they're losing steam, and that's we keep arguing to, or not arguing, telling Pacificorp they should put in some shallow wells to tap the steam because it's leaking to the surface and that's valuable steam could go straight into a turbine. Really easy to use. Um, the problem they got is a very conservative uh, developer. Pacificorp is a coal company. They generate power from coal. Their idea of minimizing risk is to have a pile of coal sitting outside your power plant. The moment you've got to drill a hole is scary thinking of peeling the resource from down deep. So they're really reluctant to put a lot of dollars in, and yet just about everyone who's a geothermal specialist would say they're probably the easiest geothermal megawatts anywhere in the U.S. at the moment if you wanted to expand a plant is sitting there right at Roosevelt. They've still got, after 25 years, they've got 250C still sitting there, 500F in their field. Could be much, much bigger.
Well, they're not jeopardizing. It is losing. They're not. Uh, they could be generating more megawatts for the resource they've got. This may be a good chance to stop, have a break. Your lunch is on your own. If you want fresh air and go for a walk, the Swana Reserve, if you head towards the open area, which will be in that direction, there's boardwalks around the edge. Um, 